Okay, our next adventure is to talk about application procedures. How do you apply for the radiation therapy program at Amarillo College? Well, there's three basic parts or chunks of things to submit or turn in. And the first part is application part one. Oh, by the way, you have to be at least 18 years old on or before the first day of classes in order to be accepted in the class. That's usually not a problem for people. Uh, by the way, our, our students are usually aged anywhere from 19, 20 or so to... Uh, mid-twenties, late-twenties, thirties. I had one fellow who uh, was 60 when he graduated, so this is for anybody, really. Anyway, application part one. There's Part one is really two things to turn in both at the same time. Uh, there's a program interest form that you can find really the same place where you found this form here, and there's a little download there. You can download the program interest form and you can type into it. Then what I want you to do is fill out that form. It's just basic information about you, how we can contact you and stuff, and where you live and, and the like. And I want you to save that. It's a PDF form. Save that PDF that you can fill out, actually, with your keyboard. Save it to your computer. Give it whatever name title you want to call it. Call it Emerald College Radiation Therapy, whatever you want to call it. I don't care. And then once you've saved it to your computer, you're going to attach it as an email to me, and you're going to be sending it to me with a subject heading, your name, program interest, down and then uh, you're gonna just get all that stuff filled out for me and in the same email that you send this program interest form I want you to submit electronic college university transcripts either official transcripts or unofficial uh, um, it doesn't really matter at this point in time whether or not they're official transcripts or not I just want to basically take a look at your college experience and your college background to see if you fulfill our at minimum academic eligibility requirements that are going to be discussed a little bit later on so before anybody goes through the whole process of applying I want to know are you eligible for the program and that this is going to help me so you can get a copy of your college transcripts you don't have to send me the transcripts or anything yet just scan them them, uh, save them maybe as a PDF document and then attach those documents in the same email that you're going to attach this uh, uh, program interest form to me. Send that all in one email to me and then stop. That's kind of the end of phase one or stage one or part one as it were. So as you're directed here that's where you just kind of stop and take a little bit of a rest and wait to hear back from me. Distant students it says here don't send me any clinical site information yet for trying to get clinical sites. We'll do that once we establish your academic eligibility. Next is application part two or phase two, stage two, however you want to think of it. And this is where you're going to be uh, completing some documents uh, and sending them all in one email again to me. Uh, separately. And worth noting, as it says here, any documents that you send to me, I don't want them to be pictures. Uh, I really want them to be scanned in. You're going to need a scanner anyway. And many printers, most printers really have kind of a built-in scanner already. So you can just scan things in, save it as a, a PDF preferably, and then send it to me. Or uh, some phones, you can take a picture and then transfer it to a PDF uh, and send that stuff to me. But I really, really don't want pictures saved as PDFs because they can be real blurry and all messed up. Really just get the documents that are here for you on our program website and then scan them in with a, a, a scanner like attached to a printer and then send those to me. And distance students, as it notes here, once you get an email back from me verifying your academic eligibility, if you don't already have a clinical site set up, we'll give you some information on how to help us establish or locate a, a clinical site for you. And here basically tells you about kind of the documents and stuff. You've already got access to this if you've gone this far. And here again it says distance students. You can contact me about getting a prospective uh, distance clinical site for you. So here's some of the documents you're going to be uh, sending to us or getting to us. And with one exception, I want all of these documents to be sent in one email with all of these documents as attachments. And the exception is going to be the smarter measure. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. So the first document is the keywords document, which you're already working on. If you're watching this video and you've been hearing me holler at these keywords, you're kind of like, okay, I've been keeping track of this. So you're going to just send that document to me as an, a, a scanned in attachment. There's also a document that you'll see called the student health form, and we'll see that form just a little bit later on. Actually, I'm going to scan down or scroll down quite a ways into the document and just give you a quick glimpse of that. Actually, no, I won't because we're going to see that a little bit later on. There's a Smarter Measure Online Preparedness Report and Self-Evaluation that there's going to be a lot of information here in just a little bit that I'll talk about that uh, you will submit to me. This will be the one thing that you don't include in your email with like the student health form and the keywords document and your shot records simply because the Smarter Measure kind of creates its own email that you get from the Smarter Measure company that you will send that to me. So it's going to have to be a separate email. I'm cool with that, so it'll be all right. 
uh, and as I kind of alluded to just a few seconds ago, you're going to send me your shot records. Now this is something that you can like scan in all your different shot records and make sure that you can document all of this information. You're going to have to redo some of this in just a, a different way as I'll <laughs> mention in just a minute sadly. Uh, but yeah, I want to get your all of your shot records to see if there's anything that's lacking or missing there. Do keep in mind that hepatitis B is a seri series of three shots to, that usually, usually takes over several months. So you have to complete this stuff before school starts, which means if you haven't started hepatitis B series yet and it's getting close to the application deadline, you may not have time enough to get that completed in time. So the hepatitis B series has to be completed by the time school would start. Then the next thing we have here is not documents to turn in. So these are things to kind of submit as an email attachment to me. You can get to work on these and submit the keyword student health form and the shot records in a document to me or rather I should say email to me. But there's also a couple of other things here that you can also be working on while you're getting this other stuff gathered up and sent to me as an email attachment or attachments to an email attached to an email. <sighs> I'm getting tired. Can't talk late. Arg. Anyway, so there's two more things to do in this part two or section two. One is to apply for Amarillo College and if you apply for Amarillo College, it's actually really easy. I'll walk you through this process here in just a few seconds. Uh, it's real easy to do. And this gives you a college ID number. And there's no fee for applying for the college. That's cool. But in order to get this college ID number, you have to have the college ID number in order to kind of complete the next phase, which is down here, the Allied Health, uh, Amarillo College Allied Health electronic application. Do keep in mind, whenever you apply to Amarillo College, the registrar's office is going to require you to submit official transcripts rather than just kind of the maybe unofficial or scanned in ones that you send to me. So at this point, you're going to have to actually get official transcripts. So probably early on when you're getting the stage one or, or, or part one stuff completed for me, might get yourself a copy of your official transcripts and scan those in, send them to me for part one. Then for part two, you'll just then forward those official transcripts onto our registrar's office. That might work. Now, sometimes the registrar's office is picky, and they might require you to send them unsealed transcripts rather than ones that you've opened up and scanned in to me. So they might be picky about that. It uh, might not be a bad idea to, whenever you get copies of your transcripts, get two copies of your transcripts, one that you can scan and send to me, and the other that you're going to leave unopened, and then just forward those to our registrar's office. Then whenever you get the... Uh, 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 application for Emerald College completed within oh usually three to ten business days you'll receive a letter from the college stating that you're accepted to the college we've got an open door policy which is great so that means you shouldn't have any problem getting accepted into the college and you're gonna get that ID number and save that ID number because you can't complete your application or register for classes or do anything else without that number now I want to really emphasize that being accepted to Amarillo College means that you're accepted into the college in general. That means you can enroll in like English or math or something like that if you wanted to. But you're, that does not mean that you're accepted into the radiation therapy program. It just means you're accepted into Amarillo College, but you still need to go through the application and acceptance process for the radiation therapy program. So again, I really want to emphasize that being accepted to Amarillo College is not the same as being accepted to the radiation therapy program. It's just kind of one of the the, the barriers or, or doors you have to walk through in order to get accepted into the program. Then there's going to be the application of the Amarillo College Allied Health uh, programs. Um, this is something where, well, we've got 17 health science programs at Amarillo College, making us the largest health science program in Texas, really. And because we've got all these different programs, and sometimes students, especially living in the Amarillo area, want to apply for maybe more than one health science program, uh, our Dean of Health Sciences mandated that all of our health sciences programs have a central application area. Uh, so you're sending me stuff to me, the program director, Tony Tackett, but you're also going to have to kind of submit some stuff online in our health science application area. And this is where you'll be if you, if you want to. You can apply for more than one health science program. You're only going to be able to really do that if you're living in Amarillo because none of the other programs are offer distance like we are. And in that sense, I kind of really don't like having this extra little step that you have to go through through the health science application area. But it is a requirement now. You have to go through this. And it's really pretty easy to do. And you'll want to bookmark this page as well. And I'll, I'll walk you through this and the Amarillo College uh, application in, in a separate short video after I get through talking about the basics here. Uh, 
but it's it's going to be pretty easy and it's uh, it's not too bad so it, it, it's, it'll be it'll be okay trust me and if i forget to mention it later i've got it written down here that this centralized health science application seems to want you to complete a background check and a cpr certification and maybe even a couple of other things uh, uh, as part of the application process but you can actually skip any of the things that cost money uh, in this process <laughs> Uh, for now, anyway, so you don't you you don't have to do those until you know if you're accepted into the program. The only thing that you actually have to kind of pay for is scrolling back up here is if you are not exempt the smarter measure, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. The computer readiness or online readiness stuff. So once you get all these things done, submit these forms in one email to me. The smarter measure is going to be a separate email. Then you apply to Emerald College, get your your ID number that enables you to complete the health science application. And once you complete that, you'll get an email that says, you've completed all this. And again, I'll walk you through this in just a little bit. And then once you've done that, you've finished part two. And then you stop and wait for the next thing. So once you've got that email, actually, I'll get an email saying that you've got, uh, you've completed the health science application as well. So uh, I'll get that email. But really, I want you to also send me an email stating that you have completed basically part two and that you are requesting the required follow-up visit, which is kind of the first part of part three. And then once I get that email, I'll contact you. I'll reply to your email and we'll set up a follow-up visit where we basically take care of talking about all the stuff that's left, which is not really very much left. So whatever is left is application part three, which is going to be the follow-up visit, a job shadow or clinical site visit, however you want to call it, and an interview. So here's some basic instructions here and like a little checklist if you want to use it as such. So here's some details. The follow-up visit is really, um, as is kind of alluded to in the next paragraph, it's really just a, an informal visit. It says it takes about 30 minutes and is casual. And if you live in the 806 area code, then we need have to do it face-to-face -face in my office. If you live outside of the 806 area code, we can do this by phone. And we just basically talk about your application how things are looking for you so far. If you're a distance student looking for a new clinical site, we talk about progress on that. Basically just kind of crossing the T's and dotting the I's with your application. I also give you like a, a point assessment, uh, uh, which we'll talk about what that means later on in, this, uh, uh, in these videos. And we'll talk about the steps remaining, which are the clinical site visit and, or job shadow and the interview. Now the clinical site visit, just to kind of give you a little bit of a heads up, if you live in Amarillo, we only require four clock hours. That's because we have so many students trying to do this. We don't have time for any longer clinical visits, really. Uh, but if you're a distance student, and this includes if you're applying for our Lubbock clinical site, then your uh, clinical site visit or job shadow is 16 hours. And you're really just there to observe and kind of watch what's going on and get a feel for what radiation therapy is like. And the clinical site gets a feel for you as well. Kind of preview of coming attractions, the clinical site visit does count as some points towards possibly being accepted into the program. And really think of it as kind of like being um, like a four hour or 16 hour kind of a little bit of a job interview. Because especially if you're trying to get into a new distance clinical site, if the people there kind of really don't have a good impression of you, they can and sometimes in the past have said, we don't want this student in our clinic. And no matter what points you have academically and stuff, you're just not going to be able to be accepted into the clinic. Uh, and you want to find out if you like them as a fit as well. So it gives you both a chance to really kind of see what's going on with each other. We'll talk more about what the clinical visit is like uh, at that time. There's a form a little bit later on in this packet as well that we'll discuss, uh, or at least look at a little bit, that you take with you. Actually, there's two forms that you take with you for your clinical site visit, and we'll take a look at those in just a little bit. So that's kind of a preview of coming attractions with respect to that. Note your clinical site visit, if you're a distance student, it has to take place in a clinic it really, this is, applies for local as well. Your, your clinical site visit has to take place in a clinic that you're expected to do your clinical duties at. So if you're um, currently living in one city and you expect to move to another city and try to find a clinical site in that other city, you have to do your clinical visit in that new city. You can't do a clinical visit at the city that you might be currently living at that you're not going to be doing your clinicals at. So in other words, another way of saying this is you have to do your clinical site visit at at a place where they can take a look at you and you can take a look at them and mutually agree that this is a good arrangement. Time for a keyword. It's been a little while, so a keyword is the word stick, like stick around or something on our pogo stick or something like that. 
Also highlighted here, it says, do not schedule your clinical site visit, your job shadow, until you have permission from the program director. So don't just go ahead and make these contacts on your own ahead of time. Always be working through me with respect to your, your, your clinical site. And here it says your, dis, your job shadow has to be done at the clinic where you intended your clinical training. Then the interview. You'll be given more information about the interview when we do your follow-up visit, but kind of suffice it to say that you're going to be going through basically what amounts to a job interview. Maybe about a, oh, it takes maybe, depending on the clinical people and what they want to, how they want to elaborate on things, it might take anywhere from 5 minutes to 15 minutes. Or it's kind of like a job interview. They're not going to ask you questions about radiation therapy because, you know, you probably don't know a lot about radiation therapy anyway. They just want to get to know you a little bit better in kind of a probably a, a typical job interview kind of situation. And this also, kind of like the job shadow, this counts towards your acceptance in the program as well. Uh, if you're in a competitive area where there's more than one student applying for a clinical site, and we'll talk about that in the student selection criteria section of this application packet, then this counts, this can be really an important way to get points towards possibly being accepted. Uh, if you're not in a competitive environment, if you live in Sphincter, Montana or wherever, and uh, somewhere far away, and you're the only person applying for that program or for that clinical site and there's no competition for that clinical site, then still you want to make a good impression because again, this is where the clinic can say after their job shadow and after their interview of you, they can say, uh, no, <laughs> we don't want this person. And they want to make sure that they've got high, well, they, they, they're going to have high standards. They want to make sure that anybody that gets accepted into their clinic is somebody they feel comfortable working with. So the, the interview is going to be a process that allows for that as well. Now the interview for Amarillo, we have a specific date for the interviews, and it's typically the very first Saturday in June, but uh, check with the program director for details that may vary from year to year, but it's typically the very first uh, sorry, Saturday in June, and that's non-negotiable as far as a date. But uh, if you're applying for a distant site, then you can kind of, uh, uh, well, I'll talk you through the process. You can kind of go through and talk with your clinical site people and set up a time for your job shadow and set up a time for your interview as well. There's not as many time constraints about that like we have uh, here in Amarillo. And in Lubbock, the uh, job interview, sorry, job interview, the, the interview as opposed to job shadow typically takes place in late May of each year and more details will be given about those specific dates as they become known to us from the Lubbock people. And it's worth noting, I've got some stuff here in red, some states and some hospitals are really picky about the job shadow and the interview where they may require you to go through some of these other things that we don't usually require until you're accepted in the program. They may require you to go through some of these things in order to just go and have a job shadow experience. So uh, I've had some clinics require, and it's actually a, a good number of them, will require you to do the background check and drug screening if, if the state requires drug screening. Texas does not yet require drug screening, but some states do. Uh, actually, many states do. Uh, they may re require some of these other stuff. Usually the background check and the drug screening are the things that they may require of you before you even do your job shadow. So I hate it when they do that, but some of them may require that as part of your process in order to get your job shadow and your job, in, I keep saying job interview, your interview, which is like a job interview. So that's kind of the basic uh, application procedures, but I'm still going to keep on going on and detailing some stuff here in a little bit. So there's a part one where you submit your interest form, uh, completed in, uh, in PDF format, uh, attach that as an email to me, also send your transcripts, then you stop and wait. Then you submit some documents to me as an email, your keywords document, student health form, we'll talk about that a little bit later on, and your shot records. Then separate from that, your Smarter Measure email will be sent to me. You apply to Amarillo College and get accepted, and then you apply to the Health Science Central area, and that ends part two. Then we've got the last part, part three, which is the follow-up visit where I give you more information and set up your job shadow and your interview. Sometimes, depending on situations and circumstances, some of these steps may come in a little bit different order, especially in part three. Uh, we'll hit that. Uh, we'll, we'll address those as they, they come by. But that's the basic order that we like to do things. Okay, some more details, um, some addendums, if you will. Civil rights requirement as part of the Health Sciences Central application stuff. Uh, you'll be required to, I think, for memory serves, you check off on something relating to civil rights. But worth knowing, part of the background check is going to check into your civil rights 
whenever your background check becomes required, whether it's before or after you get accepted, you have to do a background check. And we give you instructions about how to do that whenever the time is right. So we'll give you instructions on exactly how to proceed with that. It, it, it's something that does have a cost attached to it. But essentially, uh, something else that's worth noting here, that there's a national certification agency that basically, in a way, uh, sort of licenses radiation therapists nationwide. It's called the ARRT. And with respect to your background check, here's the paragraph that you really want to check over. If you've had any convictions of anything other than minor traffic violations, those have to be reported to the ARRT. And there's a phone number there for ARRT. And that's also going to be looked at in your background check. Uh, you know, I say that for the most part, we don't want you to do the background check until you know if you've been accepted into the program. That just saves you some money. But again, some clinics may make you do that ahead of time. But if you have any questions or concerns about your eligibility with respect to your background, if there's anything in, uh, like a DUI or something like that, then you might want to go ahead and get started on that so that you can go ahead and find out if you're going to be able to be accepted into the program. So if there's any questions about that, then contact the ARRT, and they'll have like a little process for you to go through to make sure that you can get that national certification. Because you don't want to go through two years of schooling, basically, to find out you're not even eligible to become a radiation therapist nationally. So that's something you want to find out ahead of time. Same thing with uh, our own little background check as well. So food for thought. Also, I made allusions to a technical standards form relating to general health and health requirements of the program. Uh, that form is, is in full detail in several pages, like three pages, I think, later on down the road. But basically, we're looking at there that you can satisfy basic health requirements. Radiation therapy is really not a physically taxing job per se. I mean, it's not, it's not the hardest job that I did. Frankly, I worked at McDonald's in part when I was going through school, and that was, I think, a much more physically demanding job. But you do have to be able to stand on your feet for eight hours a day. You have to have good vision to be able to see the stuff that we do in the treatment room. You have to have good hearing to be able to hear the patients. Um, you have to be able to lift some weight from the floor to hip level and maybe some uh, medium amounts of weight over your head as well. So there's some requirements about that all through there. Contact me if you've got any questions or concerns about that uh, or anything that you're curious about that may not be mentioned in our form that you're wondering, would this be something disqualifying? Because you want to know, well, well of course we want to know, but you want to know too if this is a job that you're physically able to do. Though I really would say in terms of... Um, Health. Well, actually, actually, now that I think about it, in part of the application process uh, in the online stuff that you're going to see, oh, I think I'll talk about, well, no, I'll talk about it now. Um, there's going to be a waiver form. When you do the central application for the health sciences division, there's going to be a little waiver that you kind of click on to a yes about. And it's just kind of a standard waiver form. And, I, you know, even though it's a standard form, I always kind of think, I always kind of chuckle to myself whenever I, I think about that form, and I kind of think, that the people applying for our program must be thinking in the back of their head, okay, I'm going to work with radiation, and they want me to click off or sign off on a waiver. Hmm, <laughs> is this a safe field for me to be getting into? Well, actually, yeah, <laughs> this is really a very safe field to be getting into. Um, for one thing, we've got uh, dose measuring devices that you're required to wear that measure any radiation you're exposed to so we can keep track of that. And frankly, i got to be honest with you, you're typically you're probably going to be get more you're going to get more radiation exposure just being a human being alive on planet earth than you would be getting exposed to radiation in working in radiation therapy and the reason for that is as you're walking around outside you get exposed to ultraviolet rays from the sun that's some radiation there's some natural radiation that seeps up from the Earth's crust that we all get exposed to. There's even radiation produced inside your own body. And add those three things up together, and it's typically more than you get working in the field of radiation therapy. We take radiation protection very seriously, which is exactly why we're really, really good at it. I mean, whenever you go and do your clinical site visit, your job shadow, you'll see... Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see it very well because it's hard to kind of get a perspective on this, but the walls uh, in the treatment room are six feet thick of concrete. Uh, no need to worry about radiation exposure from the treatment room. And nobody can be in the room except for the patient during the treatment, so uh, not a lot of worries. And the radiation that we work with is the same kind of radiation typically that's like a light switch. When it's on, it's on. When it's off, it's off. There's no little radiation particles lingering around the room or anything like that. So when you walk back in the room to get the patient, you don't have to worry about any kind of stuff still hanging around. It's just like a light switch. When it's on, it's on. When it's off, it's off. 
So again, we take radiation very seriously. Uh, I'm chuckling about this because I, I, I always think that, you know, whenever people are talking about waiver form, <laughs> again, they're probably like, <laughs> really? A waiver form and working with radiation? Hmm, do I want to do that? But honestly, I really kind of think probably a much more realistic health concern for people working in the radiation therapy field is maybe, well, maybe really hurting your back while lifting a patient or something. So that's something that I think is a much more realistic thing. Or maybe having, you know, your knees aching from being on your feet all day long or something like that. Anyway, how about another keyword? How about the keyword um, crayon? Crayon. Those things we used to color with as a kid. Crayon. Next is some information about the Smarter Measure Online Readiness Module. Working in a 100% online academic program is very different. If you haven't taken online, well, if you've taken online classes, you know that an online class is very different than a face-to-face -face class. And it requires typically a lot more uh, of an independent learner, it takes a lot more self-discipline, takes a lot better time management skills, and even if you've taken an online class here or there, perhaps, it still may not mean that you're ready for a program where all of your academics are online, and all even your clinics, even though they're brick or mortar at a hospital or clinic, still your clinics are managed through online communications. So it's a very different feeling. We want to make sure that you're ready for this. So we require students to complete the Smarter Measure Online Readiness Module. It's a third-party uh, uh, module that really assesses a whole bunch of stuff about your computer skills and your online class readiness. I mean, it addresses things like your initiative, your attitude, whether or not you're a procrastinator, your typing speed and skills, your online skills, your web savviness, as it were. Uh, it, it takes, it takes, well, they say it takes about 30 minutes. I would budget about an hour to do this thing because it really is really very comprehensive. And the only way you can get exemptions from this is if you've had multiple, that is more than one, online class that you can document. Now, if you just say, I've taken these classes online, I know I've taken these classes online, I, I, I want to believe you, but I have to have documentation. If you can't provide documentation, we can't exempt you from the Smarter Measure. So documentation may come in the form of uh, maybe contacting your past uh, professors or, or finding out some way, shape, or form to verify that your classes have been online. Or another potential uh, way of becoming exempt from the Smart Measure Online Readiness Module is if you, say, worked as a uh, secretary where you worked extensively with computer programs and Microsoft Office. I mean extensively, where that was basically your job description. So something like that could be considered an exemption. Otherwise, people are going to be required to take this because I feel... Uh, after having done this for a little while, I feel more and more that this is really something very important that people need to get information about to learn about what their strengths are and what their potential weaknesses are. So here's a whole kind of rundown about that whole process of how to do it, what you're going to get from it. You're going to get a summary report that you're going to uh, have sent or forwarded to me. Uh, you're going to get your own report. You're also going to write up, type up a word processing document and this is information about exactly what you're going to send to me, so pay very careful attention to that. And you're going to write your strengths and weaknesses, write about your strengths and weaknesses uh, related to the summary report that you get from the SMART measure, so that you're going to take a look at, well, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses and how are you going to address those weaknesses, and you're going to send that to me. So that's information about SMARTER measure. Here's more details about the immunization requirements. So this is just basically worked from our health sciences uh, application page. So these are the things you need to document. By the way, with respect to the varicella, which is chicken pox, you know, if you're like me, <laughs> I had the chicken pox, but it was more than 50 years ago. <laughs> oh, my God, am I that old? Uh, I am. Uh, anyway, I, there's no way I'd be able to find, you know, doctor's information of, that would show or demonstrate that I've had the chicken pox and that I don't have to take the varicella shot and stuff. So if you're in that kind of a predicament or situation with any of these, especially the varicella, then there's a couple of options. Do not revaccinate. I want to emphasize that, especially with chickenpox. Do not revaccinate. That could result in significant health risks for you later on. So a better way to, to document that, like what I would have to go through, would be to uh, do something called checking your titers. That's T-I-T-E-R-S, which is basically a blood test where they can verify that you've got the immun immunity for chicken pox. So instead of having to revaccinate, you can do that. So that's an option for some of these kinds of things. So there's immunization stuff. 
that I just deleted a couple of items that we no longer look at. So you saw a couple of things just disappear. No biggie. Application deadlines. These may fluctuate from year to year. So here it is for this year, but be sure and check for each year. So we have basically what we call a priority deadline, which means basically we've got a final deadline where everything has to be completed by May 31st. But we recognize that the application process is is complex enough with getting you know, shot records and transcripts and applying for the college and doing this and doing that, that um, you may not be able to, if you apply, if you start your application May 30th, <laughs> you're not going to get that done. So we basically say that you need to have part one and part two completed by April 15th in order to have a chance to get all of your stuff done by May 31st. And there may be some flexibility, especially with some distance students on some of this, but this is a uh, uh, our basic priority deadline and final deadline for application for the program. If you're a distant student and it's uh, uh, you may not be able to make it by May 31st, uh, we may be able to work with you on that, but uh, mm, there's some information about here that basically states we want to get you started as soon as possible. And if you're applying for a competitive area, and again we're going to talk about what is meant by competitive versus non-competitive in the student selection criteria, how we pick students for our program, if you're in competitive, then these deadlines are hard deadlines and they're not flexible. So do pay attention to deadlines. There's some more information about stuff here and what can happen with you know, waiting lists or anything like that. So that's that. And then we've got an application checklist, which uh, you can print this out and keep it somewhere. You, don't, you, you do not turn this into me. Don't turn this into me. Let me say that once again because people keep turning it into me. Don't turn this form into me. Don't print it out, fill it out, and submit it to me. This is just for you to keep track of all the stuff that you've done so you can check off things like, you know, check off I've done all of part one, and I've got this, that, and the other done of part two, but I haven't done the third thing or fourth thing yet. So this just is a way for you to kind of print out separately. Just really just print this one page and have it as a little checklist that you pin up somewhere that you can kind of keep track of where you are in your application process. Then we've got the student selection criteria, but really I'm going to make the next video one where we take a look at the Amarillo College application and the Allied Health Sciences Central application area.